I really want a hot hatchback to add to the Carmada. Could a diesel hot hatch really be the best choice? Will it tick all the boxes? Viewer discretion is advised. Some viewers might find content about a diesel hot hatchback controversial. Welcome back to Car Trouble. Now, does anybody remember the 1980s? Back when the definition of the phrase pocket rocket changed from meaning your little trouser chappy to a small fast car, otherwise known as a hot hatchback. A small practical car that was actually fun to drive. Now there's some debate amongst car nerds which was the first hot hatchback. Some say the BMW 2002 Ti, some say the Simca 1100. But for the sake of this video and not to bore you into a car nerdiness coma, let's just stick with the highlights. In brief, the first of the mainstream players was the VW Golf GTI back in 1975. Although we didn't get it here in the UK until 1979. What ifs, Germany? That was the same year Star Wars came out. Look at the size of that thing. And it wasn't available in the States until 1983. Weighing in at only 810 kilos and kitted out with a 1.6 litre engine which hoofed out 114 horsepowers. Fuck, it's 115. Kitted out with a 1.6 litre engine that hoofed out 115 horsepowers. It could slingshot you to 60 miles an hour in 10 seconds. And if you had a long enough private road, up to 124 miles an hour. That doesn't seem very fast by today's standards, but back in 1979, they thought that was going to pull your face off. And imagine getting out of that into this. The next round of good stuff came in the mid 80s. These were the cars I was in love with as a 10 year old, and I still have massive adoration for them even now. I've never quite shaken them out of my system. First up is the obvious one, the Peugeot 205 GTI, revered as the daddy of hot hatchbacks. Now this also came with a 1.6 litre engine that kicked out 115 horsepowers and it could get you from 0 to 60 in 8.7 seconds and up to a top speed of 122 miles an hour. Now it was made of paper and sellotape so you were probably safer off to crash into another car wearing just your swimming trunks. But because of that anorexia it handled like a go-kart and it was probably the best fun you could have with your socks on. The Mark II Golf GTI was undisputably the best built hot hatchback of the 1980s and it was faster than a 205 as well. The 16 valve version had 139 horsepower, which meant it could get from 0 to 60 in 7.6 seconds. Being made of sturdier materials than the 205 meant it was carrying a bit of extra weight, so it wasn't quite as go-kart like in the corners, but even to this day it's still considered to be one of the best. Then there was Vauxhall's Astra GTE, one of only two Vauxhalls that I would not happily set on fire, the other one being the Lotus Carlton, but that's got Lotus magic dust in it. Don't let the badge put you off, the Astra GTE was immensely capable. Although it couldn't be more 80s if it was sporting shoulder pads and a mullet and attending a Wham concert. It was properly cool in the 80s. Digital dash and Recaro seats. And there was a 16 valve variant which was probably the fastest of the hot hatches in the 80s. Another one to get a special mention was Renault's 5 GT Turbo. Now this was a little lightweight Renault 5 with only a little 1.4 engine in it but a Garrett T2 turbocharger slapped on it which turned this Renault 5 into a missile that could go around corners like it was on rails. And lastly, if you lived in Essex, there was the Ford Escort XR3i. And there were many, many more that I haven't mentioned. I could probably do another video on them all if anyone's interested. Let me know in the comments below. The point I'm trying to make is that even though these cars weren't powerful by today's standards, they were incredible fun to drive and most importantly, practical and affordable to run. That was until the insurance market killed them off. The premiums went through the roof because the cars were just too easy to steal. And favorites of joyriders. But what they proved was that you didn't need 250 horsepower to have a good time. But as I said earlier, I haven't got them out of my system and I really wanted a hot hatchback to add to the Carmada, something I can drive around by myself. Affordable and practical run was going to put a big smile on my face. But it's got to be a usable one, it can't just be a delicate museum piece. I don't want anything fragile. It's got to be something I can use every day. Now forget about reliability, I started to look around for a nice Peugeot 205 GTI so I could finally scratch that itch. But I soon ran into a problem. The really nice ones are 15,000 pounds, and my budget is only 6,500. And at 6,500, they start to get really nasty. Now, therein lies the problem. Most of these small cars that were once affordable are now collector's classics. A Renault 5 GT Turbo will set you back about 15 to 20,000 pounds, and a pristine Escort RS Turbo recently sold for 60. So it looked like I'm left to make a choice from the modern hot hatches. But in 20 years, they've all got a bit mental. It's not unheard of now to be kicking out two, three, or even 400 horsepowers with fuel economy to match. And that does sound like a lot of fun, but it's just not what I need right now. And some of them can be a bit. 
you know I just need something practical and economical but it's going to put a big smile on my face when I hit the B roads now I would love to say that I've made friends with the 205 grandson the 208 or 9 or whatever number Persia on now but I haven't because they're horrid so strap yourselves in I bought an Audi A1 2 litre TDI 2 litre TDI Now before you start swearing at whatever device you're watching this on, hear me out. This is the confusingly rare 2 litre TDI model. Now I say rare because most people bought the 1.6 diesel. The reason being the motoring journalist when this came out told people to either go for the 1.4 TSI engine or the 1.6 litre diesel. The justification was there wasn't much difference in performance between the 1.6 and the 2 litre. The 1.6 was more economical and it was free to tax. Well I respectfully disagree. Back in the real world, time has shown us that the 1.4 engines, which range from 122 horsepower up to 180 horsepower, are quite fragile. They suffer from stretched timing chains and cracked valves and pistons. No thanks. And due to the timing issues in the 1.4, they recommend you use super expensive super unleaded. I'm not putting freaking super unleaded in an A1. It's supposed to be a cheap toy and a workhorse. It's not Ferrari. Ich bin ein Italian. Nice try. Italia, Italia, Obe, alle. You're about as Italian as Lederhosen. Das tutti frutti, bellissimo. The 1.6 diesel that everyone was told to buy was more economical on paper, but real world owner reviews were showing that owners were having to work the engines much harder to get any kind of performance out of them. And that removed any fuel economy benefit. It's measly 103 horsepower, took it from 0 to 60 in 10.2 seconds, <sighs> and onto 118 miles an hour. Enter the two litre TDI. This one has 141 horsepower, and this engine's tried and tested across the Volkswagen Audi range. It's a great engine, and most importantly, it's reliable. I've known Passats with this engine with 300,000 miles on them. If you want to be different, you can get this same engine in a similarly pocket-sized Seat Ibiza. They were roughly the same price with the menu, but I'd rather have the Audi. Now, I know what you're going to say. 140 horsepower is not a lot. And it's not really by today's standards, but I wanted something with around about that kind of power with a similar power to weight ratio as one of those 80s hot hatchbacks, which this is. For comparison, this has more horsepower than the Peugeot 205 GTI 1.9 and the Golf GTI 16 valve. But as we know, it's not all about horsepower, is it? No, it's not. For acceleration, we need lots of torques, and this has lots. And suck on this, this has got 50 more torques than a Porsche Cayman. Yeah, 320 nimidims of them. Mm. With all that torque, it feels much quicker than it does on paper. It pulls from low revs in pretty much every gear. Audi claim a 0 to 60 time of 7.6 seconds and a top speed of 135 miles an hour. But it's the mid range punch that's most impressive. In fifth gear, it'll push you from 35 miles an hour to 60 miles an hour in 4.4 seconds. Overtake is a right laugh. And all that while returning 69 miles to the gallon. And when the early reviewers were telling everybody to go and buy the 1.6 because it's free road tax, they didn't actually mention that this one only cost £20 a year to tax. Skip flits. Looks wise, I think this is a really good looking car compared to all the French jelly moles that are out there. Hey, fatty roast beef, who are you calling jelly mold, huh? For similar money to all that French detritus, you get an Audi. They've managed to make it look both small and menacing. It's pretty from all angles, and that wheel in each corner posture they've given it doesn't just give it roller skate cuteness, it handles really well as well. The early reviewers seemed to think that the larger engine they won understeered more than its smaller engine rivals. Now that might be true, I haven't driven the smaller engine ones. But I don't know a decent front wheel drive Audi that doesn't understeer to some extent. An understeer is more preferable than skidding backwards into a tree. Whatever understeer they think this has got, I can totally live with it. I bloody love chucking this into corners. As well as being pretty rapid for a mainstream super mini, it also oozes quality. The materials in the cabin aren't your usual super mini garbage. The plastics feel expensive. 
The steering wheel is a proper chunky sporty S-Line three-spoke leather steering wheel with multi-function controls on it. The vents are these modern moulded designer units, not just boring rectangular vents. The dash design is pure elegant Audi. The seats are supportive and comfortable, the gear stick is a mixture of luxurious materials and the gear change is sublime. Precise and firm, you just don't normally get that kind of quality from a super mini. They've even managed to create a decent amount of space in here whilst retaining all the quality and safety features. The sound system's great, it's got all the Bluetooth multimedia connectivity you'd want. You can even listen to car trouble videos while you drive down the motorway. I know I'm starting to sound like a sponsored advert for the Audi A1, I'm not. I know it's not the fastest and I know it's not the sharpest hander. It's just really good at what it does. It's just a great all-rounder. I want to find fault with it, I just haven't yet. And it's got a proper handbrake too. None of these electric handbrake bollocks. So you can perform the most stereotypical 1980s maneuver, the handbrake turn. So this one's done 94,000 miles. It's a 2012 and it's got a fully stamped up Audi service history. So my budget for this car was six and a half thousand pounds. And this car cost me Six and a half thousand pounds. Coincidence? Yeah, it was a coincidence. Let me know if you think this is a worthy contender for the best all round daily use hot hatch. I know you're all gonna have an opinion on it, so please leave any alternatives in the comments below. And as always, if you're enjoying the videos and you're not subscribed, please do click on the subscribe button and turn on notifications so you don't miss any of the upcoming videos. That way you get to see my ugly face on your YouTube homepage when you wake up. Thanks for watching.